speaker is is Uma Ozbek, who is our uh, DMD program um, statistician. Now, educate us in the first of both the series of lectures, um, starting on, on biostatistics, uh, which we need to know for uh, trial design, um, and uh, starting with basics. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I guess I know most of you, but um, for whom I don't know, um, my name is Umut Özbek. I'm a biostatistician, as John said, um, and I work for Tisch Cancer Institute, and I work with Dr. Ferrara and Dr. Levine uh, closely. Today I will be talking about basic biostatistics, some descriptive statistics and hypothesis testing, and uh, I will do my best to um, like make this hour as painless as possible. So please feel free to stop me and um, ask any questions if you have. So first, uh, I would talk about experimental design we use uh, frequently. And then we, I will talk about types of variables uh, in clinical setting. And then I will uh, show some descriptive statistics we use in our projects, in our research. And then we will discuss the difference between population versus sample. And then we'll talk, we'll talk about uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. And finally, we will uh, end the um, talk with type 1 and type 2 errors. So let's um, talk about statisticians first. Um, who are we and what do we do, right? So um, I think some of my friends, not all of them, but they think we I just use uh, like formulas with Greek letters, and that's all what I do, but it's not correct 100%. I do use some formula, but not all the time. And I guess some of my colleagues think I do some magic. Well, I'm unfortunately, I'm not that talented. I'm not that gifted. Um, if I were, I would first stop the war going on in the world nowadays, and then I would do some magic in statistics for sure. So my parents, I mean, I think they think I do some serious stuff with numbers and with clinicians, but I don't know like they're <laughs> what they really think or what they really imagine what I do. And unfortunately, the society thinks we lie. Well, it is possible to lie with statistics, and there's a whole book on how to lie with statistics. But because of that possibility, we are even more careful about not to lie. Um, and I think I do some science, although I don't have a wet lab or I don't have mice to work with, but I do some science with data. But, I mean, maybe 80% of time, what I actually do is I get data from you, I analyze, I draw plots, I give you p-values. So this is our life, simple life. <laughs> um, so you might want to talk to a statistician, but why, right? So academic statisticians have uh, co-written dozens of grants and papers, and they have seen what works and what doesn't work, for sure. So it would be a great help when you contact them at the beginning of your study. And also, they can be really good at helping you to articulate your ideas and to refine your plan. Usually, we start with a question, and then we go from question to hypothesis, and then we design the study, and then we do the analysis. But it can go the other way around, too. So we can start with a simple analysis, and then it would uh, lead us to our question, and then we set our hypothesis and design. Um, and also, data collection, data management, and statistics are key collaborative components for most clinical research studies, especially nowadays. A biostatistician is required in most of the manuscripts, I mean, journals require having a biostatistician in the, like, as a co-author, at least. Um, so, our research questions are usually what groups do we want to compare and what do we want to measure? And then uh, when we decide those, we will ask when will we measure those, uh, uh, what we want to measure, right? And then uh, what we need to control in order to compare groups. So, for in our research, we usually either try to describe associations or patterns. So it is 
moderately easy and uh, we will create an analysis plan to document so we just uh, it is just an observational study and we try to find an association or the pattern between the disease or some um, let's say uh, descriptive information that our patients have right or we can we may want to make inference or attribute cause to a condition exposure so this is moderately difficult because at the end of that kind of study we make a bigger uh, statement so it requires an analysis plan before we conduct it and also we may want to predict what will happen to uh, individual subjects it is again moderately easy and again um, we need an analysis plan to document the decision Um, so we use experimental design for almost all of our projects. Um, this is how we set up the study to answer the question. You may have two main situations. One is controlled design and the other one is observational design. Uh, the best case, the best, uh, the gold standard design is randomized clinical trial design. But it is not always possible either because it's too expensive, it's too time consuming, uh, but we do our best. So uh, in controlled designs, the experimenter has control and we have exposure or treatment that we want to uh, see, uh, that we want to measure or see the result. And we may have, again, as a gold standard, we may have a randomized clinical trial if we have chance. But if the control design is not possible, then we may do observational design, observational studies. So those could be either cohort studies or case control studies. So control designs are not necessarily randomized, first of all. The ideal case is randomized designs, but they don't have to be randomized to be a control design. Uh, we, almost all of us, are really familiar with clinical trials, right? We usually use phase one, phase two, or phase three uh, clinical trials in cancer research. Phase one trial is for uh, dose finding study, and phase two is a single arm. We usually um, want to know about the efficacy of the, um, let's say, drug we are testing. And after passing phase two and phase three, phase two and phase, phase one and phase two, then we uh, can go to phase three, randomized design. It has to be randomized, and it is the, almost the final um, phase for your drug or your treatment to be approved. Again, the gold standard is randomized clinical trial, um, and it controls biases, and it balances treatment arms so that you can compare. You can really make comparison to groups. Yes. Yeah. Subtypes of tumor or TB. Right. What are they to? Um, I guess it depends, uh, mm -hmm. but some of them are for, I guess, just for efficacy, or some of them are for toxicity, and some of them are combined phase one plus phase two trials. So you use your patients you use uh, in phase one, and you include them in your phase two trial. So you can save time, you can save money using the same patient. Of course, it is under the assumption your phase one works, and then you can go to phase two. Okay. Two A studies, those finding and efficacy at the same time. Two A and two B. Yeah, two B. I probably should. I mean, there was such a thing. I could use it, and I was too embarrassed to say it, and what it was, but I probably have to. Yeah, it is. Janice gave a lot of talks in the country. So uh, here's an example of randomized clinical trial. It was published in uh, JAMA in 2014, and it is uh, like titled as Autologous uh, Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation versus Intravenous Pulse Cyclophosphamide. How do you pronounce it? Cyclophosphamide in diffuse cutaneous systemic hypnosis. So the goal here is to compare the efficacy and safety. So it is a phase two uh, trial. Um, and they are using two uh, arms, the stem cell and the intravenous pulse uh, cyclophosphamide, right? And they, their primary endpoint was 
uh, event free survival, and they define it as time from randomization until the occurrence of death or persistent major organ failure. They controlled for age, sex, disease duration, and baseline weight. Uh, and as it is written in the title, it's a randomized trial. And uh, because it's randomized, comparisons are simple because you already controlled for many things. Are you going to explain how they controlled for uh, No. Because <laughs> I have many other slides. But with the observational studies, the first um, type of observational study is a cohort study. So first, for a cohort study, we identify a cohort. And then we measure the exposure. And we follow our patients, our cohort, for a long time. And then we see who gets the disease. And then we analyze to see if disease is associated with the exposure. But cohort study, uh, cohort design has its advantages and disadvantages. So the advantage is measurement is not biased and usually measured precisely because you decide your cohort at the beginning and you follow them up for years, usually, right? And you know that at the end, you need those measurements and you are very careful to measure those over years. And it will be precise, less missing values and everything. And uh, you can actually estimate prevalence and associations and relative risks using cohort studies. Because you started at the beginning, it's a prospective study, you follow them up and you can estimate the, the prevalence and you can generalize it to the population where your cohort comes from. Would you consider the biomarker studies observational cohort studies? Biomarker studies? Well, like um, it is a retro right. right, but it is a retrospective study, right? We already have all um, patients and then we go back and get their biomarkers, right? Well, it's if not we measure a all the if we measure the biomarkers like one group gets passed on everybody, right? Follow them to see if they develop GDH daily or not. Isn't that a perspective observational problem? Um, if you started at the beginning, nobody was trans. I mean, nobody went under surgery, right? But so the bone transplant, right? But right, right. But for me, I mean, I got the data after all the survival. Right, right, after all the follow-up. But if you decide at the beginning, okay, these are my cohort, I will be working at Mount Sinai Hospital and I will be recruiting, accruing patients coming from like 2016 to 2020. And then this is my cohort, Mount Sinai patients. And then I will follow them up prospectively. Then this is an observational cohort study. And then I have no idea when, uh, how long they'll survive or what will happen after the transplant everything. So I don't know how many of them will go under surgery, for instance. Right. So this is an observation cohort study. Um, besides the advantages of the cohort study, it has some disadvantages. So it can be very expensive because you start at the beginning and you follow them for years. And it is very, very expensive if the outcome of interest is rare. So if you but if you are looking for a disease, you can see one in thousand patients, then you may have to follow at the beginning like thousands of patients, right? To see some um, who would develop over years the disease. So, um, and also sometimes we don't know all of the exposures to measure. So, okay, this is a great prospective design. We have, all, we have our cohort determined at the beginning. But if we don't know the right exposures to measure, and we didn't measure them over years, and at the end, we don't, hold, we don't have the correct exposures. And when we do the analysis, we don't have, have the correct information. So it is um, a downside or a disad one of the disadvantages of cohort studies. Yes. So to determine the association, right. so that's where the statistics comes in, so there's some magic. <laughs> that you apply to what you measured, and you're looking at some outcome, and then this, the, the word association has a quantitative right. definition to uh, right. it's just, it's right. guess there is a That's true, yeah. We will use p values for that. We will test it, and then if there's an association, if there's a significant association, 
uh, we can determine that. Uh, another observational, uh, another type of observational study, the case control study. Uh, so, for case control studies, we identify a set of patients with disease and corresponding set of controls without disease. And then we find out retrospectively about the exposure. So, uh, we can go back to uh, like our database here at Mount Sinai and collect patients from, uh, who enrolled from 2000 to 2012. And this is the case control study. This is an observational study. And then uh, we will analyze the data to see if there is any association. Again, case control studies uh, have its uh, their like advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is it is relatively inexpensive because patients were already there, the information is already there, and you just need to go back to your database and pull your data. And it takes a short time. You don't have to follow them up. Patients are already most probably, they are not in Mount Sinai anymore. And um, it works well even for rare diseases because you decide the disease at the beginning and you decide your case group. And you will just go and uh, choose who uh, had those diseases, right? So you can decide your um, sample size at the beginning. And then you can have that many patients from the database. However, it has some uh, disadvantages, of course. Um, so the measurement is often biased and imprecise because it, is, it, it depends on the database and it is a retrospective study. You may not have the correct information there. If you have a missing information, because when they collect those data, they didn't think about a clinical research study, right? They may uh, not, they might not Collective, uh, they may not have the right information, right exposures that you would be looking for. So, um, and also for the missing information, you may want to recall, you may want to contact the patient, but there is a recall bias. They may not remember it correctly, right? And also, you cannot estimate the prevalence of the disease because you are deliberately going for a case group. So, it doesn't mean that if half of the uh, Let's say I have 100 patients, uh, half of them having the disease and half of them are controlled. They don't have the disease, right? You cannot say that the prevalence of this disease is 50%. That is not true because you are deliberately collecting the data. So you cannot generalize it to the population. Um, so observational studies are like easier compared to the control trial but uh, still they leave us with questions. Um, we may have some confounders that we cannot control, and also there could be some biases, like self-selection bias, recall bias, survival bias. Self-selection bias is when uh, a patient selects um, his own group, then it's a self-selection bias. So if they say that I don't want to be in placebo group, I want to be in the treatment group, right? Then it's a self-selection bias. Or uh, recall bias is when you don't have the information and when you go back and ask them or ask doctors who collected the data or ask the patients, they may not remember it correctly. And also there is survival bias. When you do your studies retrospectively, you may focus on patients who survive longer. So it's the survival bias. I think an example I would give of self-selection bias is um, if you are um, looking at patients who got a certain treatment, but your decision is I want to give that treatment to the sicker patient, so those patients are at greater risk. Like if you were saying, well, does APG help prevent GVHD? You know, like patients who got APG, patients who didn't get APG, but everybody got APG was mismatched on the label, and all the matched SIBs didn't get it. Not self selection on the part of the patient, but the selection on the part of us. So, of course, we bias the information unless you try to account for or adjust for that. The person, for the purpose of controlling yourself. Yeah, that but you can't do an observational study. Right. In a, in a control study, you would say half the patients are going to get EPG, half the patients are not going to get EPG, and we're going to randomize it so that it's unbiased. But when you, but in many of the, so all of our registry studies, it's always when we look to see the effect of some decision, it's 
basement. Reduced intensity versus myeloblative. You can say, well, for AML, reduced intensity is the same outcomes as myeloblative. But why do patients, why do some of the patients get reduced intensity? And why did some of them get myeloblative? And, and that may be accounted for a lot of the, of the difference that you said. Well, but isn't the purpose of statistics or putting statistics to be used even in an observation? So you probably need way more patients, but right. you have to look at ATG and it, yep. you, could, you have to, you know, control for sick people who got it, but also healthy people who got whatever. I mean, you right. need a lot, a lot of patients and right. you have to control. Right. So that's, so that's a way to try to get around that, right. around that, that bias, but that assumes that you can identify right. the bias. That's true. Right. And that you have sufficient numbers to um, to uh, turn this job. Right. Yeah. If you have enough information, you can do that. So this is another example of uh, this is an example of of an observational study. Um, this is published in 2010 um, in Hematological. So um, it is uh, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for autoimmune diseases. Um, so the goal here is to evaluate long-term outcomes of uh, stem cell transplantation and to identify potential prognostic factors. So they compared transplant centers and type of autoimmune diseases. And uh, they again measured overall survival, progression-free survival, transplant-related mortality at 100 days. They controlled for age and um, they provide reports, estimates, and confidence intervals, and p-values. So this is an observational study. This is not a control trial or control randomized trial. So, and the reports are just the estimates and confidence intervals and p-values. I don't want to say just like they are really, really important and uh, useful too. So in medical research, we, um, yeah. Sorry. Perspective observational study is that redundant to say prospective observational or you is, have a I think it is a retrospective study. Okay. Yeah, it's a retrospective study. I think that's a really good. So you, so there have been patients with scleroderma or systemic sclerosis in this retrospective observational study, as well in the randomized control study, but the results might have been different because in the retrospective, it's like somebody had to make a decision. This patient wanted to transplant. And how that for systemic sclerosis, and how that decision was made in those individual centers, we don't know why they thought somebody needed it, and would, this, would that patient have gotten the same treatment at, at another center? Versus in the randomized control study, they said you can only get the transplant if you meet these criteria. So that's set in advance for everybody who's going to get the treatment, and then they also had a non-transplant arm to compare the results. So even if you just look at the outcomes of the transplants, the randomized control study was probably a more accurate reflection of what happens when you do a transplant given a set of characteristics than this sort of retrospective registry study where you don't know why why some patients got transplanted and why a similar patient may not have gotten transplanted. Um, so there are um, three types of variables in medical research generally being so one is continuous variables. Examples for continuous variables are blood pressure, cholesterol level, quality of life, and units of blood, for instance. Uh, for categorical uh, variables, we can say blood type is a categorical variable, transfused or not transfused, which is a binary variable, or cured or not cured, which is a binary variable. They are all categorical variables. Also, we um, use most of the time, maybe, time to event variables. Uh, it can be time to death, it can be time to progression, or it can be time to discharge. Uh, so let's talk about some descriptive statistics. Um, this is a density plot, and um, x-axis shows the units of blood transfused patients. And skewness is one of the descriptive statistics. Skewness uh, measures the asymmetry of the distribution. So this is the distribution of uh, units of blood transfusion, right? And um, and you, as you can see, most of the observations or uh, most of the patients were given less than five units of uh, blood, right? 
but there are some um, patients who were given like more than 10 units. But the alliance is the proportion of patients. Right. And uh, but they are uh, relatively lower than um, patients who were given less than five units, right? So um, besides skewness, we have also mean to uh, as a descriptive statistic. So this is a statistical average. So for this data, our mean is 2.42 units. So to estimate uh, the mean, we sum up, sum up all the values, and then we divide the sum by the number of values, so which would be our sample size in this case, right? And our mean here is 2.42 units. We also have median, which is similar to mean, uh, and it is, used, it is a middle value. So to estimate the median, we sort all the values from lowest to highest, and for an odd number of values, for an odd number of um, like number of patients sample size, uh, we find the value in the middle, and this is our median. But for an even number of values, we average the two values in the middle, and this would be our so median. In this case, we average the number of patients. Right. Not the number of patients. No, no, right. But so for each, for each, no, no, but for each patient, there is one uh, observation. Right. For each patient, there is one unit of, there is a unit so of blood. Right. A number of units. Right. Right. Number of units. Right. 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 Number of units. So right. you're lining up one unit, two units, three units. That's so right. Five That's five right. Five That's right. And then and the number in the middle. In the middle. Right. It would be your median. So, uh, what's the difference between mean and median? Right. They seem pretty close to each other. So, mean is very sensitive to outliers. So let's say um, number of units, right? Uh, and it is usually most of the people are uh, were given less than five units. But there is some person who were who was given hundred units. I'm just making up. So this is an outlier. This is way too much than the uh, rest of the sample, right? So mean would be sensitive to outliers because you sum all the units up and then you divide by the uh, sample size. However, median is not uh, sensitive because it won't get affected by that number, 100, lying way, um, like far away from your the rest of your sample. So when the data is highly skewed, when the data is really asymmetric, we want to use median. But when the data is not skewed, when the data are not skewed, the median and mean will be very close. So you can use either of them. Another uh, descriptive statistic we use is standard deviation. So this it is a measure of the distance from the mean to the other values. Uh, it is square root of variance and it tells how spread out the data are and it will be sensitive to skewness. If it is too asymmetric then it will be affected as uh, like mean. Mean is affected by skewness too. And uh, it, is based, it is estimated based on a uh, sample of data. So it is an estimate. So in this case, our uh, standard deviation is 2.3 units. So, so these were. Go back to that, yep. I think yeah. that's an error where people yeah. often get um, um, confused. So, what are the ways in, in which you can. Um, so, if we set the standard deviation, it's here's the mean plus or minus something. Right. That would be the standard deviation, right? Um, standard you have a standard deviation of 2.3. Right. So I think in your example, patients got 2.4 units, plus or minus 2.3. Is that what you're saying? The standard deviation? Um, I mean, yeah, plus or minus, but you may use a multiplier for a confidence interval. I will right. go We're there. We're not doing that yeah. at a confidence interval. Right. But but I think the, the, the um, what are ways in which um, of the reporting? We can, well, what are ways in which we can, how do we use the standard deviation? Unless you're about to talk about standard error or something, but I don't think this would be meaningful. So we're measuring the variation within the data, right? Right, right. So if the, if the data is widely variable, your standard deviation is going to be high. Right. And if your data is clustered together, your standard deviation will be low. Right. So if you have um, if 
you were just a simple example, if you were saying, what is the mean age of third grade, it will be, the standard deviation will be very close, small, because all third graders are roughly the same age. Right. But if you say, what's the, st what's the mean age of an elementary school, the standard deviation will be much wider, because you have all this variability around the data. In addition, if you had um, I don't know, some 20, a few 25-year-olds who happen to be mm -hmm. attending school, yeah. that would really throw off, but that's very skewed, that's really going to throw off your standard deviation. Even if uh, you get a couple 25-year-olds in the third grade, that would also throw it off. So standard deviation is a, is, a, is a numerical measure of the variability of the data. So it's, it's, it's a sort of first thought I had was it's like the RDW. Exactly. The RDW is a perfect example. And the second thing is it's kind of another way to understand how close or far apart the mean and median right. are. I mean, I understand mean and median. Yeah. I never understand standard deviation. I, I, but, but RDW is but the, exactly the same. Right. But so, so a low state. And also, I don't understand the number 2.3 was absolute value. So standard deviation goes from zero to and yeah. how does it get? How because does it's, the it's, derived actually, from the huh? it's derived from the data. It's based so on. So how do I know 2.3 is a high number or a low number? It is a high number. You, you will you will check your mean mean value. If mean is your mean ah, is so 2.4, the, the and absolute. it's almost as big as your mean. Yeah. So. Right. So if you're if you're if, if the mean was a thousand, standard deviation is 2.3. It is pretty low. Well. That's really well, the data is really clustered around. But if your mean is one, your standard deviation is four. Mm -hmm. Meaning that your data is really spread out, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and your standard deviation can be larger than your mean, especially mm -hmm. if there's a lower limit. A lot of the data is at the low numbers, but you have some patients who are very have very high numbers, so you can't have a mean of one and standard deviation of four. You know, you're not going to get there are no negative number options in, in, this, uh, in this scenario. The other thing is, when we talk about 95% of confidence intervals, are you talking about that? Yes. Okay, so we'll hold off on that. But we'll be standard deviation and sample size are tied to that 95% confidence right. And also from the formula, you can see that xi is by each observation, right? And this yeah. is our mean. And we just take the difference. How different my each observation from the mean, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's much better. But if, if you don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to translate that. Well, so the individual uh, x i just means the individual observation, and, and x with a line over it is the mean. So if the mean is two, and the in, two units, and the individual observation is fifteen, and the patient got fifteen units of blood, then that's thirteen. And you're going to sum all of those individual distances between and you square it. the um, between the mean. And you, you sum the squares, yeah. and then that gives you your at the top of that one. So the other the other factor is that since you're since you're squaring that individual distance, it's really can yeah, much. But then you think it's further than so. Yeah. So uh, these were like mean, median, standard deviation. These are all for continuous variables. What if we have a categorical variable? So let's think about our again the same example, number of units. And I created a binary variable out of those units. If a patient um, got like more than five units of blood, then I code them as one, it is high. And if the patient um, got like less than five units, then I code them as zero, it is, which means low, right? So this is my new binary variable. So I cannot use median, I cannot use mean, I cannot use standard deviation. What I will use is the proportion um, here. So I can use proportion to summarize summarize my variable. And in this case, I can say that 41.7% of my patients uh, getting high uh, like number of units, more than five units of uh, blood. So what is the difference between population and sample? So we collect data from population. It is from our sample comes from a population, but we cannot collect all data, I mean everything from population. 
we just have to we have to sample it right so and also we want to use uh, the sample to make inferences about the population so it is impossible and it is not necessary to collect all data from population but I should collect sample so good that it reflects the population right so for instance sample mean is not the true mean it's not the exact mean of population but it might be pretty close depending on the sample size and sampling method so if my sample is a real reflection of my population then i would end up like pretty close sample mean and the true mean right there is no way to measure true mean in general uh, but we want to uh, be as precise as possible with the sample mean. so in case there's any confusion about that what's the true incidence of Mono 77 and patients with AML. The only way you could know that is if you had every person on AML and you knew whether they were Mono 77 present or not. That would be true, which you can never get. But if you study 500 patients with AML and you said Mono 77 was present in 10%, that might that might be close enough to the truth <coughs> that you would consider it acceptable. And that's a function also of the sample size. If you study five patients, and it was present in two out of five, and you said, well, mono 77 is present in 40% of the patients, you might question the reliability of that because your sample size was so small. So that's the, 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 the I gave a proportion instead of the mean. But the same, same approach applies to right. the mean. So your sample data is how, the inference is how representative is that of the, of the truth of the walls and why, which you can't actually measure. Um, so, what's the difference between parameters and statistics? A parameter is a population characteristic. Population mean is a parameter, but a statistic is a sample characteristic. So, sample mean would be a statistic. So, we don't have the information of parameters, but we want to estimate them using statistics. Um, so, Statistical inference is when we use the sample to inform us about the population. We call it statistical inference. We want to generalize whatever we find. Um, so to be able to do that, we use two common approaches. One is confidence intervals, and the other one is hypothesis testing. So confidence intervals tell us likely values for the true population value based on our sample. I'll uh, talk about this more. And the hypothesis testing finds uh, evidence for or against hypothesis about the population based on sample data. So, confidence intervals. Again, we said like we have a true mean that we will never ever be able to measure, right? And we have a sample mean that we can measure. They are not exactly the same, they are different, but we want them as close as possible. So, how close is the sample mean to the true mean? To measure this, we use confidence interval. It is based on sample mean, standard deviation, sample standard deviation, and sample size. Also, the level of confidence, which depends on you. If you want to make, if you want to be 95% sure, or if you want to be 99% sure, if you want to be 90% sure, then um, you decide your level of confidence. It, it depends on you. And usually, we use 95% as a confidence. Uh, limit, right? So uh, the confidence, what does confidence intervals mean? Uh, what do they mean? It is an interval which contains the true population parameter with 95% certainty. So maybe um, yeah, an example would make it more clear, but um, So we can go back to that sort of minus on the seven. Okay. So if the if the if the if we measured five hundred patients and it was and mono seventy seven was present in ten percent and the ninety five percent confidence interval was seven to thirteen percent. It, it, it means that there's a ninety in the actual world of AML, the true incidence of mono seventy seven is somewhere between seven and thirteen percent and our confidence that the fact that that's, that truth lies within that interval is ninety-five percent. There's a five percent chance it's outside of that. The 
true if it's outside. What about, I mean, when you start out by defining that, that you can't know what the incidence is in the population, so you take a sample that you think reflects the population, mm -hmm. how can you create a definition or a number that you don't know the value of? You did measure. So you know some information. Yeah, you are not totally blind. So it's really a reflection of the sample size. Yes. So your confidence in what was really tied to your sample size. So basically you're saying the more, the larger your sample size, okay. the better your confidence. In so general. That's yes. the only thing that you just said. Yeah. Yes. You can't really know what the incidence of smart sense that means in the population. You cannot know exactly, but you can know 95%. What, what you're wow. just saying is the more, the more yeah. AML patients you right. measure, the more likely it is. It's events. I mean, if you if you know the distribution well, and if you do your sampling good enough, we don't want to uh, have too many people either. So it would uh, change your results too. You just need enough patients, enough number of patients. Why are too many? Yeah, exactly. Too many because it is it all depends on um, sample size, right? Right. That it will go too low if you have unnecessarily many uh, patients in your group or in your cohort, then your standard error will be too low. That's you don't want that. that. So we're going to get to that. But here's, here's the thing. Yeah. No. As yeah. the sample size goes up, the confidence interval goes down. And if you actually said, if you had a sample size that was really, really large, and it was 10% plus or minus 0.1, so that we said it was really between 9.9 and 10.1, that, I think, would feel is unnecessarily or perhaps incorrectly precise, that the truth may actually fall outside of that simply because that's just too tight a number. But that's general, we're almost never faced with the problem of having too many patients. Right. But I think the other um, thing about this is um, it's a confidence interval for the patients around the population that you study. So if, for example, I said, well, turns out those 500 patients all have congenital leukemia. You may not think that that actually applies to adult AMA. So, or vice versa. Where, so that's where knowing how well the population that you study reflects the population that you're interested in is really key in terms of trial design. So do the patients have the same characteristics of the patients that you want to apply the results to? Well, that's why, you have to, that's why when we do journal club, that's one of the things we really have to look at is did, who did they study and how did they study them and how many did they study and they report the kind of results. Because sometimes they don't and then you don't know. Okay. So um, standard error is uh, different than standard deviation and it's the measure of the precision of the sample statistics. So the standard deviation is a measure of the precision of the population distribution. It tells us what we could expect about individuals in the population. And the standard error is a measure of precision of a sample statistic. So it tells us how precise our estimate of the parameter is. So to calculate, to get the confidence interval, we use mean, the, pop, uh, the sample mean, and we use a multiplier, which comes from the distribution, we assume. And it's also based on the... Um, how confident, how much confident you want to be. If it is like 95% or if it is 99%, the multiplier will change. And then you multiply this number with standard error or uh, standard deviation over square root of your sample size. You want to show us how you get this 1.9 um, Because sure. I think this is sometimes, you know, something that I get stuck with. Where are those numbers coming from? Right, but it's usually 1.9 if you won't get stuck. So, so that, that, that number for, um, if you look at a delta. It's a magic one, right? No. It's not, no, it's not kind of physical. Right. I know. But, I mean, but um, uh, um, if, I know. You, if you look at a, if you look at a delta and you just, the, 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 the distance between the mean statistics, this assumes the data is normally distributed. Yes. But how do you get this number? Can you show us? I don't have the slide, but no, it's not complicated at all. So, so for instance, let's uh, let's think this is a this is not a normal curve, but let's think this is a normal curve, right? So the area under the curve is important. So if you set it as 
0.05, mm -hmm. right? Your confidence interval is here, right? 95% yeah. yeah. of time here. Yeah. So it, let's like let's just assume it's not true. It's not the correct like shape, but this let's assume this is 1.96. Okay. And the area under this curve, this part, is 0 0.025. And because yeah. you have this two way, right? This is like 0 0.02 and 0 0.02. 25, 025, 025, and so here is 0. 025, yeah. and this this number here is minus 1.96, and this is derived from the normal curve, and I will show you uh, what you need to use when you assume 99% confidence interval, or 90. Uh, so, if the data is normally distributed, then you're going to say, if you want 95% confidence interval, that's the mean. Fall summer in that that um, portion that of portion of the curve, and all you're willing to want you're willing to take the tails of the curve off and say we're not going to we're not going to be confident that that's included. If it's a five per or have ninety five percent confidence interval, means five percent of the five percent of the true mean um, five percent of the time the true mean could fall outside of that, or two point five percent on each, each side. side, and that that um, that uh, the line that you would have to draw on each side of the curve corresponds to 1.96. 1.96 to the, to the right, to the right, the right, and negative 1.96 to the left. Which is the distance that you and have that's how you, okay. and, and that means that 95% of, of, the, of the true mean, 95% of the time, um, the true mean is going to fall in that Between. area. So now, can, I'm sorry, can we go back to standard error for a right. minute to find that in terms of everything you just said? Right. No. Okay. Now let's go back to explain what that so, is. So the S is the standard deviation, right. which is the variability in the data. And um, you, you divide that by the square root of your sample size. So if, you're, if you had 100 observations, you're gonna, the square root of 100 is 10. So you're going to divide the standard deviation by 10. So your standard your standard deviation is all that variability. But why is this important? Because this is how you get more. We already kind of said if it was five patients, we had less confidence than if it was five hundred patients. This is how you math. This is how you mathematically oh, get. Sure. So this is how you incorporate the sample size right. in relation to the yeah. standard deviation. Okay. So the smaller the standard error, the smaller the right. better. I think the standard the deviation is the right. The higher will be the C. Sorry. The smaller your sample, the, the higher will be the C. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you, have if you measure 25 patients, mm -hmm. this, this gets really clear in terms of sample size, how your sample size really has to crack up in order to lower your standard error. If you study 25 patients, you can divide your standard deviation by 5. Mm -hmm. To decrease that to 10, you have to go study 25 patients to 100. Or 25 right. observations to 100. So how much you want in the standard error? Is there oh, there's well, no idea. There is no idea. There is no idea. No. But it also depends on the standard deviation. Right. If your standard deviation is small, because if your data oh, doesn't have a lot of variability, right. in it, very homogeneous, then, then you don't need as big a sample size because the data is close together. But when your data's got a lot of variability in it, yeah. then you need then in order to get that to something yeah, that you can work with, you, you have to so so this is a really key thing for yeah. clinicians and statisticians that are sort of constantly having that a debate is. because the, the statistician says, I need to know some estimate of the variability in the data in order to tell you what the sample size you need. Right, so, so how can you know what the standard deviation is going to be you have to study before you, so you have to kind of have a stuff like so for an S right. or say, right. well, I think, the, right. I think the range is going to be right. around this. Just something simple like so. That's how you determine how many patients you need. That's right. That's right. But you can't, you can't, you can't calculate a sample size unless you have an estimate of the standard deviation so you can measure the variability in the data. Right. So you have to be able to, and, and the statisticians can't just like make up a number. You can make up a number. No, you you don't want to make up a number. You just no, read you literature. Yeah, you you yeah. you read the literature yeah. and find yeah. a good estimate if you don't have yeah. any yeah. data. Well, no, it just means that if you if you if your sample size is large enough, yeah. then you're going to get results that you may not be able to. You just say right, exactly. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
understanding this up front. So uh, there's an example, uh, which is systolic blood pressure, and we have 3,000, around 3,000 patients, and the mean systolic blood pressure of all 3,000 patients is 1 to 727. And the standard deviation of uh, patients' uh, systolic blood pressure is 90. Mm -hmm. And our 95% confidence interval, when we plug those numbers into the formula, we will say that 95% of the time, it will fall between 126 and 127. Okay, but this is where people often also get caught up. It doesn't mean 95% of, of the individual's blood pressure. No. I mean, it doesn't mean 95% of the individual's fall here. 95%. It means that the true mean, or have 95% confidence that the true mean falls oh, within yeah. that value, not 95% of the observations fall within that see. value, which is obviously we know right. there's no way out of 3,000 patients that 95% of the observations were between those two numbers. And how much is the C here? So it should be 1.9. Yeah. It's 19 right. divided by the square root of right. 3,534 times 1.96. So we have four minutes and I have yeah. 20 slides. We have plenty more to go. We well, we, we're going to keep we doing this. Not today. Not today. Hours. Okay. Yeah. Right. What does this mean? Oh, you don't need to make No, you're good. Okay. She's just doing the math. She's confirming math. your numbers. Right. Keep, keep going. You made the math? Um, so, uh, what about the other levels of confidence? So, you may want to increase your confidence level. You may want to say, okay, I want to be 99% of sure when I estimate my uh, parameter, right? Or you can be more flexible or just 90% is good enough for me. So if you want to be 99% sure, then you need to replace the multiplier 1.96 with 2.58. And if you are more flexible, then 90% uh, confidence interval would replace 196 with 1.645. So if you want to be more confident, then obviously you are, your multiplier is getting bigger and your interval will be getting wider. But if you are if you are okay with being less confident, then you will have a narrower interval. But it is less um, like instead of 95 percent, accuracy will be 90 percent confident, right? But people also often get hung up on that. The way I think to understand. The 100% confidence that the true mean falls within your interval. Well, 100% confidence is being zero to infinity, right? So that's the widest possible interval because we know it has to fall somewhere in there. As we become, as we go down, if we're willing to give up the confidence that the true mean falls within those two values, the interval shrinks because as we say, well, we all want to be 90% confident or 80% confident. Each time that interval is getting smaller because to be 100% confidence, that's the widest possible. And that just means that the true mean falls in there. It's not about where the observations, the individual observations fall. It's just what's the true mean. Why would you have 95 uh, Somebody who said that a long time ago. It feels good enough. General consensus amongst a handful of people in uh, 25 that's years ago. That's part of the dimension. Stop here or yeah, let's, let's, just let's stop here. Let's kind of a clinical trial design example. 
about, let's say, stopping. So as we're studying patients, we're making an observation about some type of toxicity. And we want to say if, two, if, if the proportion of patients who experience that toxicity exceeds what we expect, we will consider the treatment unsafe and we want to stop. So we're going to say, well, the upper, the, the true, the incidence of this complication, we expect it to be 30%. And we really don't want to be above, above that. So we're going to take the number of, if, if the proportion that we're seeing, we're going to say, well, we're going to make a 90, as we enroll patients, we're going to keep measuring the proportion of this toxicity. It could happen in one out of one, two out of five, six out of, you know, 12, whatever. As we're measuring it, we're getting um, a 95% confidence interval. And if, that, if the lower limit of that 95% confidence interval exceeds what we consider to be, is above what we consider to be intolerable, 30%, then we're going to say it's too toxic. So initially, with that first patient, even if that patient experiences the toxicity and the incidence is 100%, 95% confidence interval, clearly the lower limit of it is going to be below 30 because they're not, we don't have any confidence. As we, If it's 4 out of 10, we're still about 40% is still in that unacceptable range. But that 95% confidence interval is it's going to still, the lower limit is still going to be below what we consider unacceptable. So we're saying, well, we're, it, the true rate of toxicity may still be less than 30%. But as we, as we continue to march along in our sample size, as it gets bigger and bigger, and that confidence interval gets smaller and smaller, then eventually we may get to the point where we say the lower limit of our 95% confidence interval is 32%. So we know that the true rate of toxicity is 95% of the time, it's somewhere above 30%. We no longer think the study is safe. Terminate the studies. And we can measure that continuously through the conduct of the trial. Good yes. question. So let's say I got unlucky and the first patient that I have developed the toxicity. So yeah. how many, or how do I calculate many, or how many more events I can wait for? Well, that's the point that you get a table. The statistician like Uma will generate a stopping rule table that says this based is how many what? three based on the, the the map. When does when does the incidence of this when does the purport when does the a, a way that you would could set this and you have to decide what you think is unacceptable, but the way that you would set it is if the upper if the lower limit of the ninety five percent confidence interval exceeds the value that I can accept, that's when I stop. I got and it. that will continuously change based on the number of patients observed. And you might even say for the first three or five patients, you're not even going to have a stopping rule because even if all five of them develop all three right. of them develop a complication, okay. you just know it's not, well, the not truth could still fall well okay. within what you would consider acceptable. So, you know, it's a lot of math. That's why we hire statisticians to collaborate with us on this because this is not, you know, we have specialists. But the concept, I think, should now be more clear about how we can design trials using these types of uh, statistics. Thank you. I think you can stop. Thank you. Well, that um, was great. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Both Thank you. <laughs>